I like in Psalms where the scripture says his mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say his mercy endures forever and it repeats itself over and over again. Three or four times maybe, maybe even more. I like the Old Testament reasoning that a lot of the writings said things like his mercy endures forever. They seem to understand that God's timing required the long suffering of God. And that when we're reading in the New Testament we hear about how the long suffering of God that men should perish. The long suffering of God that we should not deal with as according to our sin. You see, if God didn't have patience, we'd all be dead. I mean, quite frankly, think about it. You have blown it at times. And you probably have already blown it in your day. Maybe. The Bible tells us that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's always good. And yes, Jesus died once and for all, for all sin, that you know we should no longer be you know, tossed to and fro of every wind and doctrine, but that we could have the realization that we have appropriated forgiveness and God has treated us not according to our actions, but according to his faithfulness in Jesus, redeeming us to himself according to the foreordained knowledge that God would cause us to be found in Christ and not in ourselves. So it's really not about our works as far as, you know, righteousness is concerned or salvation. But forget about all that for a minute. Aren't you glad that God doesn't just smack you around? That God doesn't just stomp on you? Aren't you glad that He's patient? He's long-suffering? I like thinking about that because, you see, I'm impatient. I get frustrated at times. You know, like yesterday, you know, it's kind of like I'm looking at my little tiny little like, see here today. You know, these guys right here. As a matter of fact, here's a couple of them. I don't know if you can see this on the camera, but they're about one inch. <laughs> they're from seedlings. One inch. It's been a week at least. Okay, maybe two or three weeks. They ain't growing so fast. And I want them to take off and become giant plants like this overnight. You know, like super fast, like drive you know. In America, that's the way it is, you know. Americans are hasty people. Everything doesn't work. Let's get it done real quick. Well, it doesn't work that way. You see, there are things that God has put into place, and God has put into order, and God has said His will is according to His timing. Sometimes that sucks <laughs> for me because I still want it. You know, I'd like to see those suckers grow overnight, and it won't happen. But still, I look forward to their growth. So in the meantime, you know, I'm I'm kind of glad that God is patient, you know, and He's purposed creation in such a way that I can look at it and realize, yeah, it takes time, and you know, if this little plant had grown too soon, then when a freeze came or a chill, it had been wiped out. Wouldn't be perfect timing for it to have fruit, to grow in its season, to develop as God chooses to develop it. And that's kind of like, you know, what happens with you and I is that a lot of times people think that when they get saved, they know it all. And you can always they run around thinking they know it all. At least at first, you know, Okay, maybe at first they're in love with God, but then shortly after that, they think they know it all. They're running around telling everyone else what to do. And that's usually the sign of immaturity, not maturity. You see, it takes time to learn wisdom. Wisdom is the appropriation of knowledge and experience and the Spirit of God working in a person's life, combining these things to give them something to look back on as far as their life's experiences are concerned so that they can look forward to what the realization of helping other people is like by giving the same comfort with which the comfort they've received. In other words, the wise man is able to give to every man an answer for the hope that lies within him. I know for myself I have people ask me questions. Thank God so far every question I've been asked, I got an answer. Of course, I usually ask God for the right answer because I got lots of answers. <laughs> Been through lots of experiences. 
but the right answer for the person can only be appropriate or made real or made quickened by the Spirit of God. So I don't always know exactly what a person's asking me, and I don't always always know what a person really needs to hear from God. I only know that what I've experienced in my relationship with God, I can share personally and intimately with a person. So I do. I said, well, you know, this is what the Bible says, and this is what I've learned, and this is how it seems to apply, and boom, boom, boom. And they're like, wow, wonderful. And I'm like, well, whatever the Holy Spirit said, great. And you know, I learned for myself also, because sometimes I even watch my own videos and go, you know, like somebody recently told me, wow, that's an awesome video. I went, really? Let me go listen to it. So I went and listened to it. I went, man, who's that dude teaching? <laughs> sure isn't me, because I'm a real screw-up. But you know, I was fascinated, because it was God, obviously, inspiring the words coming out of my mouth, and it spoke to me, you know. Me speaking to me, so to speak, you know, and so I don't know about some of these other pastors or teachers or elders or deacons or whatever they are, you know, where they go, oh, I don't listen to my own teaching. Uh, pardon me, but I think some of you are lying because I know better. But the rest of them, yeah, they might not. But no offense to them, if it's the Holy Spirit inspiring them, maybe they ought to because, wow, you know, if you're given a gift, you know, let God use it according to His will. And the Spirit of God will apply it to you according to his choice. You see, there's always got to be His will, His choice, His timing, His way, His purpose, His design, and His plan. And when you combine all that, you come up with wisdom. Likewise, when I'm gardening, I have to use wisdom in knowing when to plant and when to water and when to transplant and when to reap and when to sow and when to fertilize and when to grow and when to do all these things and sometimes you know we have to do that with other people you know you have to give them space to grow you have to allow them the opportunity to develop their own personal relationship with God for myself one of the greatest venues I do is so contrary to what Christians say that hey Come convict me <laughs> if you can. But I give my wife, you know, because you know she's young in the faith, much opportunity to grow on her own, to develop her personal relationship with God, not to be in the shadow of someone like me, because obviously I'm kind of like an obnoxious character personality type. <laughs> you know, I'll get in your face, <laughs> so to speak. So I like to see her develop her own personality, her own uniqueness, her own distinction with God that's personal and intimate with Jesus herself so that she could have her own relationship with God so that I could be inspired at times. Like, I'll lean over and I'll look down the, the porch, you know, and I'll see her down there and she's like praying t -boat. No, she's not doing that. She's Coppernicking. No, she's not doing that. She's praying. You know, she's kind of got her eyes closed. You know, she's kind of you know, gone in the spirit, so to speak. And she's praying for her family, you know, her children to be saved, you know. Praying for her grandchildren to be saved, you know. And I feel like God will honor that in time. But it doesn't happen overnight. And it hasn't happened yet. But we're praying. In the meantime, you know, it's knowing that we can commit ourselves to He who knows better than we do. And that's what we have to do a lot of times with each other. We have to commit a person into his care so that we can leave it there and let him take over, being Lord, being God, and being in charge of that person. You see, that's why the Holy Spirit was given. Not just to point out people's faults, which is what a lot of people do with the Holy Spirit for some reason, but rather to let God work in a person's life as he chooses. For the Spirit gives gifts severally as He chooses and dispenses them as He chooses and uses the person as He chooses. In other words, the Spirit of God gets to do what He wants to do the way He wants to do it, whether you admit it or not. You're not the one in charge. You're not the disciple maker. Sorry. Only God can apply it inside the heart. You can only apply it to the outside observances. Oh, you can make a religion out of it. <laughs> Most people do. But the reality is what changes a person is what goes inside their heart, what inspires them, what 
conspires to make them fall in love. You know, what really sends them over the cliff of you know practicality into the realm of spirituality, where they know God. against you personally. I'm giving you plenty of room to grow. Believe me, go ask God. He'll tell you. <laughs> That's what I had to do. You know, and boy, did he put up long suffering with me. Because I used to argue a lot. Matter of fact, there were times in my early Christian walk when if I didn't get the answer I liked from God, I said, fine, I'm out of here. And I split. <laughs> Backslid, you know. And I didn't want to deal with him because I knew better, you know. It's like, I thought, I, I, I don't want that, you know. I mean, I knew better in one way. I knew he was right, but I didn't want to deal with it at the time. And then when you finally get through the area of suffering for your stupidity, you know, that's where most Christians learn from. When you get done with suffering from your stupidity, then you begin to kind of yield to this reaping and sowing thing, you know, where you kind of like to plant a garden of, you know, peace, love, joy, meekness, kindness, gentleness, you know. You kind of like to plant other things than your stupidity in the garden of your soul so that way you can kind of reap something other than how dumb you've been. You know, and I'm pretty stubborn, so, you know, I've got lots of my life that, yeah, I tell people, yeah, I was in ministry, I was being ministered to, <laughs> so to speak. Ooh, slapped around a little bit. But at the same time, you know, I never denied God completely. You know, there are different times God knows I've asked, the people have asked me, you know, are you Christian? No, I'm not one of those. I'm kind of like one of these, you know, kind of fast shuffle, you know, like Jacob. But, Really, the bottom line is, you come to a place where it's like, of course you're a Christian. You're so obvious because you talk about God all the time. Of course you're a Christian because it's so obvious you pray a lot. You read your Bible a lot. You do a lot of things that, pardon me, but that's what Christians do. <laughs> oh, well, I guess you are one. Oh, yeah, kind of obvious. But until you allow for the long suffering of God to take you gently through the stages don't be surprised if you're like Abraham, one minute denying that you're married, the next minute admitting it, you know, and then saying, well, I'm sorry, you know, it's, you know, Pharaoh telling Abraham, well, why didn't you at least tell me it's your wife? I mean, come on now, what are you doing, trying to pimp out Sarah? <laughs> that's what it sounded like, and it still reads that way to me, you know, maybe you don't see it that way, but that's the way it reads, and that's the way it's written. He, he quite frankly, got all kinds of wealth and health and prosperity from giving Pharaoh his wife <laughs> and denying it's his wife. It's my sister. It's my sister. No, it's not, <laughs> you liar. But looking at Abraham, we also see God was long-suffering that he would take him to the place of being the father of many nations, the father of our faith the father who would even go so far as to trust his God and offer up his only begotten son. Oh, well, his only son. That God, well, okay, one of his sons. <laughs> Let's get rid of it. His only begotten son, his only son. This is because Ishmael likewise was blessed and it was his son. But the point being is that Abraham was willing to trust God in the end because it took a long suffering time of going through the experiences of life in order to get to the place of faith. A lot of Christians today, they want to have it all now. They want to have all faith. So they, they dive in, you know, they may either go to like Bible school and think they got it all, or they go to some mega church, you know, and they think they're hearing it all and seeing it all and feeling it all. They go to some other place or whatever it may be and they think they are all. But the truth is, you're never going to be all of all. You're going to always be learning. It is a process of going This is what everlasting or eonia means. It means that ages to ages to your life, from one age to another 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 age to that kind of dispensation, that's where the dispensation is different, right? 
is that there's something that makes one age different than another age. I mean, you know, you can call it whatever you want. God calls it what he chooses, and we don't know what it is. But the point being is that at the end of this age, the thousand-year reign and all that stuff, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, which is another time frame that will be a beginning and an end. And, well, it won't end, but it'll be a beginning and an end as far as that part is concerned. Then there'll be something else and something else and something else. That's what it means by eternal life or ages to ages life, which is what God has promised us. If it was just eternal, it could end because we're not eternal, so bingo. For us, it would look like eternity, but we would be terminated. <laughs> the Terminator would have had us. But the point is, because there's something happening in each one of those call them whatever you want. They're not stages. They're not ages per se, but they are different segments of God's perspective. Then that means we're learning something new about God. And we're told by Jesus that this is life eternal, that they should know you is God. And he who you have seen. How about you right now? I know I can't know God in any way, shape, or form. My brain just would implode or explode one way or the other. Because I'd either think too much and implode or be overwhelmed and explode. But I'm learning something. You know, and what I'm learning, I like. You know, God is love. I like that. You know, I know people right now can't figure out how God is love and apply it to the Old Testament. I can't. I've had no problem from that from the beginning. Or that God is love and that how can that be that someone would go to hell? Well, I have no problem with that one. I can explain that too. Some other time. <laughs> Come on over. We'll talk. <laughs> yeah. Coffee. Bring more coffee. But I can trust him. He's long suffering. His mercy endures forever. I mean, there's some just good stuff in there, you know, that tells me that I can trust God. You know, and I don't have to freak out or fall out of faith. I like that. I kind of like the more that I learn, the better it gets. Oh, it gets challenging more. <laughs> but I don't feel like it's going to end in my dis disapproval of God with a stamp on my forehead saying, no, you're rejected. You know, <laughs> Sorry, you're not the right quote-unquote image that I want. No, I think that God is at work both to do and to will of His good pleasure in my life to cause me to become more so at the end of my life, like what he wanted me to be at the beginning of my life, by saying that I would be presented faultless before him with exceeding joy, according to the promises that God has given to us that we can read about and know that God is working to do that in us. I like that. That means he's doing it. He's completing the work he's begun in me. He who has begun a good work will complete it until the day of salvation. And I'm thrilled with that concept because that means, hey, the man upstairs, you know, so to speak, you know, the big guy, he's got it under control. Well, that makes me feel good. Because the more I learn about this long suffering and his mercy endures forever, the more I realize that's why we can forgive each other. That's why we can, pardon the expression, put up with each other. Well, we're going to be stuck with each other for eternity, so guess what? <laughs> if you ain't going to hell, guess what? You're going to be in heaven, and you, know, you got to deal with it. <laughs> you got to deal with me, too. <laughs> Oops. E. Wow. You got me for eternity. Our little joke. <laughs> oh well. Suffer, sucker. <laughs> but the reality is is that there's more people that you're going to have to get along with and you will get along with whether you like it or not because the mercy of God endures forever and his long suffering is such that he doesn't want anyone really to perish, but he's given every opportunity for those who would call upon his name to be saved. And that's why it takes time, really, to develop the It takes time to become the woman of God, the child of God that you should become. It requires time for us to really get a handle on this experience we're going through called life. It 
will involve listening to God and allowing His Spirit to work in us so that we can come to the place of knowing Him as the Lord our God, the maker of heaven and earth, and maker of me. I mean, is that really where you want to put the rubber to where the road is, or you know, kind of put you know where you're standing in faith? I mean, it's about me, isn't it? Maybe <laughs> not, but you know, just so you can get that out of the way, you know, and kind of like put it to bed, then He's the maker of you. So if He's in charge of making you, then what you can take to the bank is He's going to get a return on His investment. Your the investment he has put his son's life into. And so you have the opportunity to struggle at times, you know, flounder at times, fall down at times, make mistakes at times, but remember, it's his long suffering. It's his mercy endures forever. It's the ages to ages to ages experience of growing in the knowledge of God that's going to get you through eternity and into knowing that you don't have to be impatient but that you can have peace recognizing that God isn't just in control but he's got everything working even if it's a little frustrating even if it's a little aggravating even if it's a little bit kind of not like what I like to do but he's got everything in his time and not ours.